You know, we're stuck with the evidence we have. We would love to. Nice? Well, no, nice right now? well, no, it's the truth. You know, we don't get to pick our witnesses. We've got to deal with what we've got, and we've got to do the best we can. There was a wealth of hard, cold, physical evidence, DNA and everything else, that showed that George Zimmerman lied in his statements to the police. There was no sort of narrative that, that this, this jury could follow, that America could follow. Well, the problem you've got in a trial is you can't say, jury, don't speculate, and then ask him to speculate. And so we're left with a defendant's story, and what we attempted to do as best we could is to prove that his story was false. Therefore, why would he be lying about something? Something minor like trying to get an address. I mean, I thought that was blatantly, obviously, a lie. And when I was talking to the jury, when I was arguing to the jury, I, I saw them nodding their heads. So what was the deciding well, the factor? Problem, and was it a group decision? Yes. yes. And, and the problem you have is that there was enough evidence, even though I would, I would argue it was insignificant or very little, that there was self-defense. You had John Good. You had other people. So they were going to be able to get an instruction as to self-defense. And once we knew that was coming on, we felt we needed to put this, this statement on and just disprove it. And you had the injuries. And the injuries indicate there was some sort of a struggle. Our position all along, we never said that Trayvon didn't do something to George Zimmerman. What we said is you can't take a concealed weapon and encourage or incite a fist fight, which is what he did by stalking a teenager who didn't know who he was, and then whip your gun out and shoot. And that's what he said. I just got my gun out and shot him. Never explaining the details of how he was able to pull his gun if he was being beaten as brutally as he claimed. And so we had to put all of that in, and then we clearly refuted it with the physical evidence. No DNA on Trayvon Martin's hands, who supposedly were covering his bloody nose. You know, so many other things. And those lies were put in front of the jury, one after the other after the other. We heard his story or stories depending upon your perspective, right, of what he said on audio tape, on videotape, at the scene, in the police car. What was your story? What was your story? Everyone's wondering, well, what was the prosecution theory of what actually happened? Well, we were left with inconsistent witnesses in terms of what actually happened and his story. And what we were trying to prove is that his story was false. Our, our belief as to what happened, he chased down Trayvon Martin. He wanted to make sure Trayvon Martin did not get away. He felt Trayvon Martin was headed towards the back, which is normally what had happened in the prior cases where the guys had gotten away that allegedly had committed crimes. He was going to make sure that uh, Trayvon Martin didn't get away and was going to be there when the police got there. Now, at what point he pulled out the gun, we could speculate as to what happened. My theory is he pulled it out early. He was, he was going to make sure that he didn't get away. He wanted to be a cop. The screams. What did you think the first time you heard it? As soon as I heard those screams, it sounded like a young male's voice to me. And as soon as I heard that the screaming stopped when the minute the bullet was fired, the second the bullet was fired, I knew it was the victim's voice. That was one of the most compelling aspects of this case. I saw a defense team that had to turn the table on the entire prosecution, beginning with villainizing Trayvon Martin and then villainizing you, the prosecutors, because you guys are hiding all the evidence. You guys aren't giving them what they're supposed to have. They, they kept saying it and saying it and saying it. Did you, did you feel like a villain in the courtroom? You know, I thought what they were trying to do is create issues for appeal when there really weren't any. You know, there was this thing of, we've got to depose Ben Crump. They're hiding this. We did that. Ben Crump never testified. There was this issue about this evidence that came out. Our IT person uh, testified about that. You know, they had the evidence. Their own witness testified. Mr. Connor testified that they had it, but they were trying to create these false things that were going on from the media standpoint. What we were concerned about is, what's the jury hearing? And as long as the jurors said, we, whatever we've heard, we can set aside, and we hopefully they stuck to what they said they would, it's irrelevant. But you're right, from the standpoint of what the public, what they were trying to tell the public, our position has always been is we try the, the case in the courtroom. Let's talk about that relationship. Have you ever experienced this before, Bernie, during a trial, during a case? What was going on between this defense team and you guys? You know, I've been doing this for 30, over 30 years now. And I've had some tough cases. I've had tougher cases, quite frankly, than this. Murder of a police officer where everybody thought I'd lose it. So 
You know, there's always in the courtroom, you do battle. But at the end of the day, you respect your opponent. And the fighting is in the courtroom, not trying to sway the public out there, which is what was occurring. Do you respect this defense team? You know, I'm not going to comment about them. I'll leave that to other pundits. One word to describe George Zimmerman. Murderer. George Zimmerman. Lucky. Trayvon Benjamin Martin. I don't know if there's one word that can describe victim. A victim. Trayvon Benjamin Martin. Pray. P-R-E-Y.